Welcome to All Right in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. Our guest today is Elaine Feeney. Elaine Feeney is an award-winning poet, novelist, short story writer, and playwright from the West of Ireland. Her 2020 debut, As You Were, was shortlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize and the Irish Novel of the Year Award, and it won the Kate O'Brien Award, the McKitterick Prize, and the Dalkey Festival Emerging Writer Award. Her second novel, How to Build a Boat, is long-listed for the Booker Prize 2023. Previously, Feeney has published three collections of poetry, including The Radio Was Gospel and Rise, and her short story Sojourn was included in The Art of the Glimpse, 100 Irish Short Stories, edited by Sinead Gleason. Feeney lectures at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Welcome, Elaine, and congratulations on the Booker nomination. Hi, and thanks for having me. Thank you. So you've talked about starting out in writing as a slam poet and then moving to page poetry and finally to fiction. Um, What do you think that particular writerly path has contributed to your writing today and how did it may have influenced how to build a boat? Mm. So I started out in the well, I started out as an actually as a page poet when I was about 10. (laughs) So the slam poetry came later. Um, It wasn't a genre I was particularly familiar with. It just happened that I saw an advertisement for an open mic in the regional newspaper here. And I had like, I often make a joke that I had a lunchbox of poems under my bed and I decided I'd pull one out and go and perform at a slam. And I had no idea of the historical context of slam poetry or the American influence. Um, And I'm not sure that anyone else who read that night either did. So we were just really (laughs) reading our poetry for three minutes and it was very like an open mic. Um, But that scene, that poetry scene that I was involved in, in the early noughties became a very sort of angsty political space for poets. And um, although I'm, I'm loath to do a retrospective on what that might mean to the whole larger canon of Irish poetry it definitely was more uh, angry and 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 I suppose in a way trying to break the lyric maybe just purely because we were that generation that we felt you know there was lots of things to fight for politically and we were probably I was quite influenced by the beats at that stage um uh, but then like I mean I I always loved books I always loved novels I always loved poetry. Um, I just like literature in general. So it wasn't a huge step for me to to go and write a novel when I got the time. And I think it was really time dependent, to be honest. It was just when had I time to actually dedicate to this kind of huge chunk of a project that I might do. Um, And the poems are easier in some ways with regards to they're quicker. They can, you know, you can write a poem maybe in a couple of weeks where, you know, if I get invested in a novel, um, I end up like not washing myself by the end of the first year, you know. <laughs> in How to Build a Boat, the central character is Jamie, a young man in his early teens, just entering secondary school. He's so diverse, which isolates him, and he's also keenly observant and very confident in some ways. How did you create this character and what do his unique balance of qualities bring to the story? So... Jamie was really, he was like a character in my head for for years and years, actually. And um, even as I was writing As You Were, How to Build a Boat was knocking very strongly as well. And it was just this boy and it was really, at the start, it was sort of voice driven. Um, and he he kept kind of saying things like, you know, I, I'm very much an auditory writer. And I suppose um, that might go back a little bit to the slam poetry um, influence, but he was just this boy that just kept saying, did you know that, Elaine? Do you you do know that, Elaine? Did you know that? And he was just sort of pointing out things and coming along with me on lots of journeys. Um, and then 
I just really I was very I was fascinated. Um, I'm fascinated by the school system here. Um, not always in a very positive way. I was a teacher for years and years for nearly two decades in an all boys school. Um, and I'm just fascinated by singular people who go into spaces and institutions that all, might not always suit their needs. Uh, it, again, it, As You Were was a similar novel in some ways for me with regards to the institution. I think I just like to put these sort of free spirits that like are very open to the world and open to influence into these oppressive structures. So whether it's a school or a hospital and I'm working on a third novel, which will also be an institution. Uh, but it's just this idea of a kind of a mind that wants to sort of think outside of it. So Jamie, yeah, he very much was this boy that was knocking. And I suppose it mirrors my own sons. Um, they were starting secondary school. One was kind of gone halfway through. My other son was about to start secondary school. Um, and I really did consider what the type of school like Christ College in the novel what it might do to somebody like my own son as well, you know. Um, so I was really interested in pushing Jamie into this space and investigating how he'd get on in it, if, you know. Yeah, Jamie does search for his own spaces, doesn't he? He went, His mother died when he was born and he's drawn to an online video of her in a swimming competition. <clears throat> And he also becomes fascinated with a famous female mathematician that he all finds online. So what do you think that Jamie's looking for in the mathematics videos or the mathematician who presents them, say? Okay, so he he's quite obsessed with Marianne Mirzakani. He's quite a, he's quite interested in lots and lots of different things. So when he was younger, he was very interested in the sort of the the gothic nature of the work of Edgar Allan Poe, which seems r- ridiculously precocious. But um, I was interested in that idea of children who are hyperlexic um, and have reams and reams of information, but not necessarily know where what to do with them or cognitively might not comprehend them, but are very articulate with this kind of big chunks of information. So I'm very, I was intrigued by that idea. Um, and like he, he's interested in art. He's inter- He was interested in nature as a younger boy, but he sort of moves away from that as a teenager. He's interested in film. But I think Mirza Kani, um, you know, some people have said, is he a savant? And he's in my, my authorial or my author intent was that he's not actually. He's just very interested in Mirza Kani as perhaps this woman who could fit the ideal of his mother in his mind. So this woman that he thinks might mirror his mother. So he has this one clip of his mom in a swimming gala um, and that's all that, that survives of her. And his dad doesn't have pictures of her around the house. He's in a, he's utterly sort of transfixed with grief through the whole novel um, in a very quiet way that he actually starts to blend away from the the story in some ways and he's in utter pain but Jamie is far more matter of fact about it and he just wants to build this perpetual motion machine which obviously it can't happen it's it's only a hypothetical machine and he's trying to find somebody online or some theory that will actually help him to build this machine and if he builds the machine he might recreate the kinetic energy of his mom Noel swimming and then he might feel her and I think it's he's quite tactile in that way that he really just wants to feel her. But of course, his dad doesn't want to enter these conversations with him because he just, I suppose, wants the boy to get on with school and try to make friends and try to live in the present where Jamie's, I suppose, is living between the past and the future. And in the space that he's in, he's really, really cluttered. Um, And I suppose in some ways, like he has his granny next door, but it's this idea that adults, Sometimes we do with children is we hide them from the pain. In fact, instead of actually answering their questions and trying to maybe figure it out. But Mary Zakani also, I was a bit obsessed with her myself. So that sort of is a bit of a an interest area of mine. So some of Jamie's interests do intersect with my own sort of deep dives on things. And I have a habit of doing that as well. So and also she's amazing. You've talked a little bit about your interest in institutions institutions and writing about them and your experience as a teacher this story is set in a conservative catholic school and some of the attitudes about gender and women that are promoted there might surprise some north american readers they, they were kind of new um, or old if, if i could may um as a writer what appealed to you about that particular setting what was it that you were looking to draw out of that yeah i mean it, it's really interesting to me that it it might be unusual like i mean 
I think that institutions are interchangeable. You know, I think that just this is the culturally the institution that perhaps I'm familiar with in the West of Ireland. So, you know, even even in Ireland, some readers have said, you know, it reads a little bit like the 1950s um, in some ways. And I understand that. But we have obviously the the setup in Ireland is that actually in primary education, 90 percent of the schools are actually run by the Catholic Church so that the patronage of the schools is under the the, the, the religious ethos of the Catholic Church. Um, and obviously that will depend on a school by school basis. But where I used to teach, where I taught for years, uh, four of the five secondary schools in the town were run by the archbishop and one school that was apparently um, multi-denominational was named after an archbishop. So in that particular town, it was very much the church was in control of the, the I suppose, the, the ethos of the school in some ways. Um, so there, there are situations that I would be familiar with and that, you know, my husband went to an all boys religious secondary school. Um, and like we've had lots of conversations about this, about rearing our own sons, trying to find schools that might fit more with our, our what we would feel are our progressive attitudes. And they're harder to, they were more difficult to seek out and to find. And um, so it was really, it, it was important to me because I do wonder with a child like Jamie, this this kind of hyper fascinating individual who takes things quite literally at 13, like many 13 year olds do. You tell them a story and, and they believe it to be fact and they want to figure that all out. I'm just, you know, I'm just fascinated by some particular students in those spaces. Um, and I do think that the world is still, you know, I, Sometimes we think we're going forward with progressive attitudes around gender and so, you know, and so forth. But actually, it's just sort of cyclical. And I, I feel I feel that we're pushing that same boulder up the hill constantly. And I asked my mother about this and she said, yeah, and just you just keep pushing it. And I said forever. And she was like, yeah, maybe forever, <laughs> which is exhausting. <laughs> the plot of this book is both personal and straightforward. At school, Jamie connects with two teachers, Tess, who is in a failing marriage and isolated from her only family, her father, who is living on the streets, and Tig, a new teacher and a loner who comes from a small Irish island. And together, they start building this Irish boat that is traditionally a communal construction project. What is it about that contrast between isolation and community that you wanted to draw out in this book? Yeah, I, I'm fascinated by community and by uh, the beauty in the community and, and grassroots and what people can can do when they come together. And I'm, I'm always fascinated by when you put strangers into a space. And actually, that pattern is meant to mirror something about Mirza Kani's own work in maths. So it's meant to mirror it, putting three strangers together. But that's a very long and complicated a parallel that I'll get completely wrong if I go into it. But it's that whole idea of you know, you can you can meet somebody on an average day in an average place um, and you can have like a relationship with them. And I was interested in taking while the family is important in this novel, it's quite like there's blended families. And obviously, you're right, Tess is very much an isolated character. Um, and the Irish novel is very much um centers around family and it's a very family often you know we we see the big family sagas in these novels in these Irish novels and I was really interested in taking it into the space of a community and an intergenerational community where you know young people are 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 in communication with their older teachers or grandparents and that eventually people start to kind of trickle into the scene um and the Karak the boat that they build is very important because I feel in with my generation, so I grew up on a farm in the west of Ireland and was quite ashamed by the humble sort of peasant habits of my grandparents, you know, drinking unpasteurized milk or, you know, thatching roofs on houses and so on. Um, and as I got older, I realized that there was great beauty and great respect and great power in their traditions that I couldn't look at I couldn't look at them for years I couldn't even and and they've all passed on now and I kind of wished I spent more attention or paid more attention to these things that they were trying to teach me even though I just I just wanted to run to a city very quickly so I suppose in some ways it's a book very much yeah it reads at quite a simple 
prose level, but there's sort of undercurrents that I'm trying to, you know, talk about the idea of preserving this traditional craft. Um, and obviously I kind of, you know, really go into that in detail. So I apologize to readers that, you know, there's three chapters that I felt like I had to build a boat in the novel or you'd all need your money back. So you can scan them or you can really do a deep dive. It depends. But it changes point of view there. But it was very important to me that I get that as right as I could and that I preserve the beauty of the craft of this boat that was so important to people in the past, um, particularly it's, it's synonymous with the West of Ireland and particularly on the West Coast. It is a classic, yeah, for sure. Um, the dialogue also contributes to that sense of isolation. The only character who expresses what he thinks is Jamie, and even he keeps his thoughts to himself at times, right? So can you tell us a little bit about your approach to dialogue and why it's important to the book? I am. That's very fascinating. I think that's the first time I've been asked that question. So thanks, Sarah. But um, it is I am so interested in missed communication and in how we we really, you know, we enter scenes in our lives and we want to, you know, express ourselves articulately or, or adequately and, and maybe express something that's inside us. And we often I walk away from situations I might do it after the Zoom and say, well, I didn't actually express that or articulate that correctly. Um, and I and, you know, there's room for nuance and so on. But in Ireland, historically, after, you know, we went through a decade of huge change culturally and with legislation around women's reproductive rights and also around marriage equality. And there was this sort of decade or a little longer of people sharing the most intimate human stories. And I've talked about this a lot on the radio and on the media about their like, you know, their innermost sort of secret caverns and and places just sort of to affect change in human rights. And I, I understand that we needed to do it and that it was a really powerful sharing of stories. But I'm always concerned about when the person is left on their own then after having overshared, not overshared, but shared. We were so secret for so long in this country I and mean, it was suddenly a sort of a tsunami of conversation um, so with these characters, while I didn't want them to over reveal, if that makes sense, because I don't think humans really do. And there may be a frustration with my work where people will say I never get to the root of them. Um, but but that's that's on purpose. <laughs> you know, I don't ever I don't ever know. Do we ever get to the root even of ourselves? You know, and I think it's very much a coming of age story for Jamie. But it's also a sort of a coming of age story for Tess as well. She she's been frozen for so long. Um, in this state of stasis, like she's just kind of in this uh, suspended animation. And I think she just about starts to move again in the novel, if that makes sense. And I feel that that might mirror something nationally with women in Ireland. Um, I think that you don't have to apologize for that because it actually felt very authentic and it helped you identify with the characters because who does ever actually say what they mean to say all the time? You know, it's very hard to do so. Thank um, you. And you're welcome. Another um, aspect of how to build a boat that's a little unique is that you use different points of view at different times. At times we're in close third person with the main characters. And sometimes you also use first person, especially with Jamie. Um, why did you choose this kind of fluid structure and what creative goals were you working toward with it? So it was always meant to be close third person. And um, I have been working for a few years and it was, yeah, that sort of bird's eye view, you're beside them and it switches, you know, very well, thanks for saying seamlessly, I hope so. Not always. Point of view is really, really difficult, right? Um, but when it came to building the boat, I just, Jamie had become so huge and, you know, as this character with me and I wouldn't write the whole book in first person, Jamie, because it just wouldn't be the right thing to do, I didn't feel. And also because I was really, really interested in Tess and Ty. It really is a three-hander ensemble novel. You get to know Jamie and Tess, his teacher, but Ty less so. And I don't think anyone would ever get to know a man like Ty. So that really interested me. Um, but I just really wanted to show Jamie's frustration with the fact that nobody was following a blueprint around the Kurok. That the idea, so 
he was so at odds and that to come together in this community space, he really hated it. <laughs> you know, it's not this beautiful, oh, let's all come together and I'm going to make friends and this is going to be good. He he was very suspicious of people getting involved in his projects because obviously they were going to, you know, may, you know, will it float? Will it not float? But also sharing his space with someone was quite difficult for him. Um, and so I really wanted to show that sort of frustration. And I, and I felt he was quite, I felt I got to a kind of a loneliness in him that I hadn't noticed earlier on in the novel that by the time I got to this, I did feel a huge amount of empathy for him in that moment when he was getting frustrated with the other boys coming in and the teachers thinking that this might be a good idea. Um, you know, and I mean, I'm going to sit on the fence. I ask a lot of questions off that scene, but I can't answer. And of course, also, I had fun with him taking on some of the male role models that he did sort of consider and discard. <laughs> the world of this novel is small and specific, focusing on family and personal relationships, yet somehow it feels like a big universal story. What do you think makes this book different that gives it a reach beyond its interpersonal world? So, yeah, that's lovely of you to say that. I just have to deal in microcosms. I just have to deal. I like. I mean, the the small. I'm I'm really interested in the poetry of Patrick Kavanagh, and he has this great poem called Epic, which is just about a, a local row, but he brings it into European politics. Um, of course, the local is universal. It should be. Hopefully, it is. That again, institutions are interchangeable. People, you know, the human condition. Is, is the same drives and desires are are part of the human condition for all of us in some ways in some ways and they they differ obviously with regards to like the geographical space of this or the language of it obviously the language is slightly unusual because because being from the west of ireland we translated from gaelga into english um historically so there's a sort of a different speech pattern and rhythms and you know some of it is in hiberno english which i'm happy about you know, going into and, and and delving into it. But I think that when you needle down into just people's interpersonal stories, I'm really interested in how people interact with each other on any given day. Um, and, you know, great epics are written, they're done. I'm just really fascinated by where we are now, what, what things are, you know, really upsetting the world in some ways. And I suppose in, in many ways, I wanted to get this novel away from screens and away from individual isolation and loneliness that I feel that many of us are experiencing. Maybe it's post pandemic or maybe it's just the state of the world now. We've never been as connected, but also disconnected, I feel, you know. So I was interested in that whole idea and particularly around loneliness. Along with speaking of connected, uh, there's the Windsor to Galway connection. And uh, along with Biblio Oasis, we are thrilled about the Booker nomination. And we're curious, as the author, what do you feel are the biggest personal creative achievements? What do you think that you nailed in this, in how to build a boat that, that you wanted to, or haven't tried in another form or in another work? Oh, <laughs> you asked the sticky questions. <laughs> I, I, Ah, I, it, this is a difficult question for me. I am going to write a great novel, hopefully someday. That's what I feel. So I feel that's the only burning desire inside me is that some someday I'll create something that I'm pleased about. Um, and I know that's a nightmare. I'm a nightmare for a publicist and I love Bibli Oasis. So I'm really sorry, <laughs> but it's just, you know, I, I, I really wanted this. This novel was to be simplified, simplified, simplified. It's meant to be accessible. It's meant to be an accessible novel. I felt with my poetry in the early days, it was quite, it was hard to access it. I felt um, I'd done an English lit degree and I know my grandmothers were very proud of it, but they didn't fully understand it. Um, but now I re realized that that was actually the fault of me as the poet and not their fault. And I wanted to write a book that that people could enter wherever they wanted to enter the story, if that makes sense. So they can they can enter it and just read it and skim through it. Or they can, you know, maybe have an interest in the patterning or the language of the Hibernos part, or maybe Jamie's point of view switches, or maybe not notice any of that at all, and still that it doesn't exclude them. So for me, it was a really important thing that the that the novel was this 
inclusive space, but that it also read well. Um, so I hope that I've achieved that, but I realize art is so subjective. Writing is so subjective and everybody has a different opinion. And, uh, you know, I, I understand and, and I'm really open to readers' opinions with regards to what worked for them and what didn't work. But at the end of the day, it's a book and I just had to abandon it. And yeah, I did write a great poem once. It's the best thing I've ever written. And I kept reading the poem over and over and I was like, that's a good poem, Elaine. And I don't like my work generally. And I said that um, that's really, really good. And I realized there were two lines of Yeats in the poem. So, <laughs> so, and I, so I realized that, uh, yeah, so I had to scrap that. So I re but but I, I understood there was some magic in this poem that was different to all my other work. So, yeah, it, it is difficult. And I get, you know, I just have to leave the books aside and and, and move away from them and say, that's done now and move on with the next thing. I think the desire to write a great book someday just means that you're not done yet. So that's very encouraging for all of us readers. So <laughs> oh, thank you. So what are you working on? Oh, you're welcome. So yeah, what are you working on now? So I have a poetry collection coming out in April called All the Good Things You Deserve. Um, and I haven't had a poetry collection since 2017 with the two novels. So I'm actually really excited for that with regards to it always draws in a sort of a different type of readership as well. And I think it's going to bring back in people who maybe read my earlier work and hopefully, you know, there'll be a nice kind of symbiosis across the, the books. Um, I'm also working on another novel, a third novel. And I am working on a play for stage. So we're going to do an adaptation um of there's a, there's an adaptation sort of slated for a kind of a spin off of just Tig's part in the novel weirdly somebody was interested in this and that it's his story so hopefully that uh I also teach full time so, so it's all a bit of a juggling act with the mothering and you know the dinners and cleaning all right would you like to read something from your work for us yes please thank you so I'm going to read just I'll just read from the prologue, actually, if that's OK. So this is sort of a, a moment in time where we flash through Jamie's life, sort of from his early years, um, just in a, a walk in the woods with his dad own. Jamie said, when I grow up, I will be as tall as these trees. And he sprawled fast like a salamander along a trunk. He climbed to the first branch when Owen said, Whoa, Jamie, careful, and lifted the boy back to the ground. Own, Jamie said. Did you know that resin from trees makes arrow tops and they are so hard they can go right through you? No, I didn't know that, Own said. Jamie nodded furiously, then dragged his damp nose along the red sleeve of his anorak, saying, Did you know that trees turn into all the things? Tall trees were Jamie's current favourite. The Scots pine matured fast, lived for centuries and housed red squirrels. Jamie loved the colour red. He also loved patterns, books with dust jackets, cats, rain that came with wind, the curvature of objects, Edgar Allan Poe and rivers. Jamie hated sunny days and the red sky that slung about the trees today was a good sign that a shower threatened. He liked rain pelting his face, soaking the layers of his clothes until they were sopping and heavy on his skin. Winter was Jamie's favourite season, November his favourite month, for November was predictable. Nothing happened but a heavy darkness covering the town like a weighted blanket, and the sideways rain was ferocious. Winter was bare and unburdened, leaves disappeared from the big oaks and the river brew, an unspectacular river, grey on a grey day, blue when the sun shone, became so white on a day of blanket fog you could not see the opposite bank, an infinite and uninhabitable space. The white fog excited Jamie like an infinity of ghosts, though he did not believe in ghosts. Infinity excited him, he believed in infinity and ferocious things terrified him, setting alerts flashing in the crevices of his busy brain. Soon Jamie and Owen passed the stone-corbelled ice house. Its earthen-domed roof was overgrown with tufts of grass and knotweed. 
Here the river bends and carves into the horizon, and Jamie liked to walk this far to get close to the estuary. And though he had never been on a boat to feel its energy beneath him, suddenly he was filled with an urge to do so. They watched a man sail past in a curroch and wave at them, and Jamie considered whether the boat looked more like a black slug or an upside-down sea monster. He settled on likening it to a pirate hat he had to wear last year at Terry's sixth birthday party, just shortly after Terry had arrived in Emery. The party's hat, thin elastic, pinched Jamie under his chin until it burned his skin. He ran out screaming and eventually sat in silence at the end of the garden, watching rumbling cement trucks roll past to the new estates until Owen came and rescued him and in turn rescued the party. Terry's mom saying, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, and trying desperately to hug Jamie, his face mashed up against her. Elaine Feeney, thank you very much for joining us today, and we wish you all the best with the Booker nomination. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.